Bonjour et bienvenue sur la chaîne. Bonjour and welcome back to the channel. Smack and see Deutsch. We're not going to Germany. We're not going to Germany. Right. Well, many thanks to Buddy for starting our video off and welcome back. And in this video, we are going to look at what you have to do for the first time when you're going abroad in your motorhome. Yes, we're very excited because we are only two sleeps from setting off to a big European adventure to where we're going? Eastern France, the Alsace-Lorraine region. Hopefully, but we don't know because we can go wherever the wind takes us. Sassy Lorraine. And we've seen lots of things on Facebook, re quite recently actually, of people going abroad in the motorhomes for the first time. And obviously two years ago, that was us. So we thought we'd put a little list together of all the things that we've learned. It's not comprehensive and I'm sure there's loads that we've missed, but it might help you if you're taking your van over for the first time um, and what you might expect to find on your way. Yes, so this is really for motorhome virgins. Or camper vans, because we're not vanist. I don't wave at camper vans. Well, I do, and it's usually a white van and they look a bit perplexed. I wave at everybody, even lollipop chap. However, maybe there's something else for people to learn as well, or pass on some amazing tips to us in the comments if we've missed anything out. So in this vlog, we're going to cover 10 different areas and stay with us because we're saving the very best one till last. Although don't get too carried away because it's not mega. And in the spirit of X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, The Masked Singer, and all those other high quality video productions, these are in no particular order. So first on our list is the vehicle documents. And we keep all our documents in a little folder like this that sits behind the chair. Just means we've got access to them. And the mandatory documents that you must have are your V5, your insurance, and your driving license. Now, as I say, we keep a hard copy in here so it's easy to hand over if anybody wants to see it. We keep it in the cloud so that we can access it from wherever we are in the world. We keep a backup copy on the laptop and we also email them to ourselves. So there is no chance that we cannot get hold of our documents if we ever need them. In 2008, the worst thing that could happen when you're travelling happened to us. A dizzy old Doris rammed right up my back end and smashed our vehicle up. It was a nightmare to sort out. However, we had all the insurances and roadside recovery in place. Our current roadside recovery or breakdown service is part of our insurance policy. But if you don't have that coverage as part of your insurance, you're gonna to have to get yourself a single trip roadside recovery stroke breakdown policy. Please make sure you check the small print, i.e. the cover relating to the dimensions of your vehicle. A lot of cover only covers up to seven meters, some are funny about height, some are funny about weight, so don't pay your money without reading the small print. And also, while we're looking at small print, check your insurance documents cover you for your destination country or countries and for the duration of your trip. Because not mandatory, but a good idea is to search on the internet and download a European accident form. A lot of European drivers will have them as well. So if you were involved in an accident, you both complete certain parts of each other's document, then it all helps sort out what is gonna be a bit of a minefield over the coming weeks. Number three for us is about what you need to know to be driving about the roads abroad. And there are loads of different places you can use to find this out. 
reuse our atlas. It's got a list of all the different countries in the front with what's required, the RAC, the A, they've all got lists of what you need in each country. And the important thing for you is to just check where you're going and what each country needs. But this is what we've got in our van to make sure we're safe when we're driving abroad. What forgot that's mandatory, Andrew? Mandatory items that we carry are, we have our number plates with the UK logo on. And if you don't have that, you can have a UK sticker on the back of your van. But remember, GB stickers no longer valid. We also carry reflective uh, vests or jackets, one for each of the occupants of the vehicle. We also carry two warning triangles. Some countries insist on one, some insist on two. Hence, as Jane said, Check the route that you go in the places you're visiting because there will be some subtle differences. We have beam deflectors on the headlights. I've been a bit cheeky this time because I haven't took them off from the last trip six months ago, but I haven't driven at night, so it's not mattered. That's about six pounds saved. We also carry snow chains and we have tires that have got the three might and peak and snow symbol. That covers us all year round across all the European countries because they all change and vary certain times a year. Do you need snow tyres? Do you just need snow chains? Do you need both? Some tyres need four millimetres of tread in certain places. So again, looking at specific countries on your route is the ideal way to make sure that you're safe and legal. And finally, not for us, but if you're more than three and a half tonne, just look into the angles more at stickers, which are warning stickers placed on your vehicle so that cyclists don't come up your inside and you run them over and squash them. Some might say that's not necessarily a bad thing. Oh, might get a few comments from cyclists there. And that's just the mandatory items that we're carrying. But there's also other stuff that we carry. So they're not mandatory, but nice to have. Or, if you wear contact lenses or glasses, make sure you've got spares. There's some confusion about whether that's a legal requirement, but it's just common sense. If you're going to ruin your holiday because you can't see anything, you might as well just go home. I always carry my rose tinted glasses. That's what I've got to wear all the time. We also carry a couple of first aid kits, fire extinguisher and a fire blanket in the van and uh, we have spare bulbs now again the information about whether you legally need spare bulbs is confusing however we believe that it's not a legal requirement to carry them but if you get caught without a bulb and an important bulb um, working then the police will find you so you might as well have them and then you can do a quick stopover when we've traveled before we found it difficult to know where to go to buy spare things um because it's just you don't know where to go, do you? You go to Halfords in this country. Where do you go if you're in Bulgaria? Bulgaria. I also carry cotton wool for my ears. <laughs> and we do carry oil because last time we were travelling, we couldn't find the right grade oil for the van and we had to go to a Peugeot dealer. Yes, some of the later model Peugeots and Fiat's are running a 030 viscosity. And normally when you go in a petrol station or like that, you'll get 10.30, 10.40, 5.30, 5.40, blah, blah, blah. But, but unusual just off shelf to have 0.30. The new Peugeots and the new Fiat's burn a bit of oil. Therefore, Alfred's is my friend. And finally, um, not mandatory, but it is if you're going into certain cities. So is, mandatory then? Well, yeah, but you don't have to have it if oh. you're not going into the cities. Is the critter. And this only costs a few euros, you get it online and you need it for the bigger cities, Paris, Rouen, that was a whole list if you look online. Um, again, important thing to know is don't get conned into paying more money because you can pay a lot of money for the critter when you just go to the official website and it's a few euros. If you, you get your little sticker, you stick it on your windscreen, but if you've left it too late, then still apply for it because having the email and just literally being on the register is enough if you get stopped and asked. And if you're going outside of France, Germany have got their own version and a lot of other countries have similar. Or if you don't have a sticker, you can register your vehicle in various websites based around where you're traveling, sort of towns or city specific. Yeah, like when we were in Belgium, we had to register for Antwerp, Brussels and Ghent, I think. 
Um, and it, that was just a quick, simple online application, upload your V5 and you're registered. So do check in the countries that you're going what their um, LES or ULES rules are. And Spain doesn't have one, but the recent stuff I've read is that they expect you to have one from a different country. So if you go to Spain, a Critère from France or the German equivalent should do. But have a read of that because, that, it, it, again, it's a bit woolly and a bit vague. But if you've got one, they're a one-off payment for the lifetime of your vehicle. So you might as well just do it and stick it in the window. It's easy. If you've never driven abroad before, don't panic. Driving standards across Europe are sketchy in some places, um, but it's not that bad. Just take your time. Presume everyone on the road is trying to get you and you'll be okay. It's a bit like riding a motorbike. I ride, I, I, I've ridden motorbikes and, and, and if you go with the mindset that everyone else on the road's an idiot and trying to cut you up and trying to run you over, you're very defensive. So just do that. What I would read upon is the priority à droite in France, priority on the right. But also they're running similar systems in Scandinavia and across Europe. So again, check the country specific information. But in particular in France, because what it's saying is that traffic approaching or coming onto your lane from the right hand side have got priority over you. But it tends to be in smaller towns and, and, and yeah. smaller, slower areas rather than 60 kilometre an hour roads. However, if you know and recognise the signs, you'll know to look out for people just pulling out in front of you. Because they expect you to know that they are coming out in a town and it's happened to us when we were in Scandinavia. And so you just have to be aware of it. And then once you're out of the town limits, you'll see the opposite sign to the priority of Duarte and you'll know that that then no longer applies. Because obviously you're not gonna have people pulling out on fast You roads. get the priority of Duarte sign with a black bar, diagonal bar through it. You'd be better off just not having the sign and only putting the priority sign up when it is a priority. But there you go. If I was in charge of France, that's what I would do. Oh, if Andrew ruled the world, what a world it would be. And also, remember, if you're popping through France into Spain, they deal with roundabouts differently. So have a look at their roundabout rules. Because if you do what we do and we go, it's past 12 o'clock, so I'm going to go inside lane and then peel off, you'll be in the wrong. So read up about Spain's roundabouts. And finally, for being on the road, the most important thing is don't forget, as a retiree, your Werther's Originals. Yes, I like to have something to soak while I'm driving. I don't. <laughs>
within five days of us coming back to the UK, we'll need to visit a vet again and he needs a wormer. And that gets filled in into the animal health certificate so that the French customs can sign this document so that we can get back into the UK. We do still keep up with our wormer whilst we're away and Buddy's also covered for flea and ticks with a monthly pill. And yes, before you comment, we do know that we can go and visit a vet in Europe and get Buddy a pet passport, but we've just not done that. We are well prepared for bugs, beasties, mozzies, flies, gnats, ticks, the whole shebang. Start with a basic SWAT. Electronic SWAT, can have a lot of fun with that. Trying to zap the old midges, flies, etc. We've got jungle formula, we've got skin so soft, we've got citronella, we've got candles. We've got a tick removing kit that will also work for the dog. We've got just about everything. And the new, untried yet, Boatex killer. USB powered and it, it entices flies through there and then vortexes them. Now it's supposed to suck them into that little vortex there. there. Let's put your hand in. No. <laughs> Go on. No. Go on. No. Put your hand in. Go on. I didn't hear a buzz. This seems like a massive fail. <laughs> you just need to be more accurate with your tennis racketing. We often see on Facebook questions about what you're allowed to take over into France from England. And legally, you're not allowed to take any meat, fish, dairy, fruit or veg. In practice, nobody's ever checked us as we've gone across through the Eurotunnel. But that's up to you to decide what you want to do about bringing anything over. There are some great supermarkets over on the continent. And if you're familiar with Lidl and Aldi, then it'll feel just the same as being back home. But the local supermarkets are also great to look around and see what's different. When we're at the supermarkets, we don't leave the van unattended. So one of us always stays in the van because we're just not sure about security, but that's our personal choice. And obviously the supermarkets are amazingly well stocked with lots of local produce. But if you want your UK favourites, then take those with you. We don't travel anywhere without enough tea bags and HP sauce to last us our trip. If you use refillable gas cylinders, then you're going to need an adapter for France. And there are two other ones that work across Europe as well. Easily bought from Amazon for about 25 quid for the set of three. I always buy enough of the Elson chemical to last us the duration of the trip. I'm sure you can get it abroad very easily, but I've never just seen it in a petrol station or anything like that. So when I need it, I don't want to have to search for it. So I take two litres for every month of travel. And of course I only take the green stuff because many sites will only allow you to use the Elson if you're using the green chemical. Security is at the core of everything that we do. So remember to read reviews of the places that you're gonna to go to and you don't have to stay there if you don't feel safe. Especially in Europe, it's so easy to find an alternative park up or an alternative site without too much driving. So if you don't feel right, it's not right. And we, we'll always move on if that's the case. But we do have some security measures in place. When we bought the van, we spec'd an alarm. Common sense, really. The van's got an immobiliser. We also spec'd a tracking system. So if the van's nicked, we make a phone call and it can be traced with GPS. We also have CCTV. Although it's not real, it's a baby monitor. But for a small amount of money, about 15 quid, it will actually alert you if there's movement in the van. You can use the internet to connect to it and see what's going on. It'll record, etc, etc. So a really good device. With night vision. With night vision too. A really cheap but effective thing that we do is I have a monopod for my camera and I keep it by the door just in case I need to fend off any French fillies. But also, I place it across the door 
and I've got a small strap then if anybody does manage to break the lock it's just impossible to open the door without at least making a lot of noise or a, a lot of damage that would in the night maybe wake me up but either way it's because our door has only got a central locking mechanism some others have an upper and a lower so I just found it a weak spot and, and I've addressed it and do you think you need to batter off French fillies? Yes, they're always knocking on my door. Monsieur Sullivan, Monsieur Sullivan, come out to play. Like that. Either with your socks and slippers on. Yeah, that's a, that's a French, that's a European thing. If you've got a high key roof light, these little plastic things, which you can get on eBay for a couple of quid, just help that bar from being prized open. In the past, I've had a steering lock on the van, but I noticed all the time it was making little marks. So I've got rid of it, and I'm just trying this one. Visual deterrent, so it's bright yellow, so people will see from outside. And it uses the seat belt buckle to secure your steering wheel to the seat. That's it. Et voila. And you just, there's a key, a key to unlock it. It's visual. Yeah. In the front of the cab, I use a couple of straps that basically attach the doors to the seats. So therefore on the outside, if you were to pop the lock, you physically couldn't pull the door open. Now they utilize the seat belt buckle. Bear in mind, I've already used the seat belt buckle for the steering lock. On the driver's side, I just use this strap to attach the driver's door handle to the steering wheel. Whereas on the passenger side, I use this as intended with a seatbelt buckle. We often get asked where we find our park ups. And since we've been motorhoming, we've still really only ever used park for night as our main source of information. And that's because it's on our phones, it's really easy to use and it's a community app so that we get lots of feedback on each of the park ups and helps us decide whether a place is a good place to be or whether there's been any issues with people in the past. Some of those are paid but a lot of them are free. However, in France in particular, there are even more options for finding park ups. And we've got a few here to show you. Some of them we've used before and some of them are new to us too. I can't stress enough how easy using a motorhome in Europe and in particularly in France, I can't stress enough how easy it is. There are thousands of places to stay, from campsites to airs. Some are free, lots of free. Places to get water, places to dump your waste. It's just, there's something for everybody. So the first one is the um, camping car taxi and this is available all over Europe and this is um, an off-season discount for campsites and we use these to find campsites that have maybe got um, washing machines and dryers so that we know we're not having to go reaching around for a laundrette. In France they're as cheap as 13 euros so they are a really cost-effective alternative if you do want to stay on a campsite. Some of them in here have got swimming pools and for 17 to 19 euros, in France at least, that's a bargain. Talking of swimming pools, remember boys, that in France, in all swimming pools, you're not allowed to wear swim shorts. You have to wear the old budgie smugglers or the Daniel Craigs, or in my case, the baguette smugglers. We have also used the um, Airs book, which is huge and has so many different park ups in there, many of which are duplicated on park for night, to be fair. Um, and we're going to have a look this trip to see how many are on park for night or whether it's worth paying for the Airs book because it's not cheap and it comes in two halves. There's that many Airs, it comes in two halves. So it's quite a bulky thing to carry around. I don't think we'll buy that again because between... Well, we, we didn't. We scrounged this off a friend. I don't think we'll ever buy that because between Park for Night and just a, a search on Google Maps, 
which was your heirs, I, I think it's redundant. What we have done this time that's different for us is try to plan for being here in the summer. We're going to be in France June and July. We don't know how busy it's going to get. So we have invested in the camping car card and it was only, what, a fiver? Fiver for the card and then, so you, you pay for them to send you a card and then you preload it with euros so that when you go to a camping car park you swipe your card it lets you in and it, it debits that card you don't have to pre-arrange it you can on the first time you visit one of the uh, airs buy the card there and then but i just thought it'd be easy to preload it the beauty of that is again it uses an app but it will tell you how many free spaces there are at each of their airs and they're all about 10 12 maybe 14 euros uh, and they're all like a uniform standard so you know you're going to get a good standard so we're going to give them a try this time what we think is happening and we've seen a few examples is that airs that have been either managed by other companies or have been free in the past are now converting to the camping car park so it's a way of standardizing across france they're a bit like the premier inn of, of airs and i think we'll use these this time uh, in particular in july when we think things will be getting a bit busier so that's it it's not rocket science again it's just about choosing where you want to be and then looking around for the different accommodations that there are it could be a campsite it could be an air it could just be a car park in the forest but we always park ethically and we use the camping code so we don't park near people's houses we don't park where it says we shouldn't and we stick within the limits of how many spaces there are on an air so otherwise they'll just take them away so there And we said we'd save the best tip to last. And I said, don't get too excited. But it is the best tip. And that is really to get out there, enjoy your motorhome, travel slowly, see lots, make memories, and stay safe. And chill your beans. Because oh. motorhoming in Europe really is that easy. So if you've struggled and fumbled your way around the Lake District, you've queued up for stuff, on the NC500, take the plunge, get across the mainland Europe, even if it's just the other side of the water, if you've got short holidays, just enjoy France, it's a piece of cake. So thanks for watching and join us next time when we actually get there. When you'll see me, Paul, in France, see you.